In this lecture, we're looking at Dun Scotus and his reaction and his development of the scholastic movement after the time of Aquinas. And Scotus is one of these pivotal transitional figures in the high to latter Middle Ages. Scotus has not always been appreciated by those in the modern world. In fact, the honorific that's given him as one of the doctors of the church is that he is the subtle doctor. Now, when the Catholic Church names him as the subtle doctor, of course, they're not using it as a sort of backhanded compliment. But in the modern world, it is often taken as this. Scotus' name, in fact, teachers always like to point out, is where we get the name Dunce. Whenever we use the word Dunce, we always have in mind the poor child in the corner wearing the Dunce cap, being punished for being so dense. And there is something of an analogy here to what the Dunce word was in the Middle Ages. Dunce, in its historical meaning, actually refers not to Dunce Scotus himself, but to those who followed him, the so-called Dunsmen. And what's meant by this is Dunce Scotus himself was very subtle, hence the name, the subtle doctor. He had lots of different distinctions and lots of different categories that he applied to the scholastic method. Well, those that came after often got a little ham-handed in their use of the analogies or the subtle distinctions that Scotus had come up with. But historical jokes aside, jokes about Dun Scotus being a bit too obtuse and hard to understand, what we want to do in this lecture is talk about the ways that he is important, the ways that he shapes the late medieval world, and ushers in some changes to the ways that we talk about scholastic theology. And we can begin by just looking at Scotus' life in general. Actually, compared to others in the Middle Ages, we know very little. We know that he was Scottish. In fact, the name Scotus just simply means the man from Scotland. It's not actually part of his original name. His name is actually John Duns. And the name Duns, too, follows a medieval pattern of naming a man according to where he comes from. John was born in the village of Duns, which is in Berwickshire, in the country of Scotland. He later becomes a member of the Friars Minor in Dumfries. He is thought to have studied at Oxford, though there is no evidence as to what college he was a part of or with whom he really studied. In terms of historical record, Scotus comes onto the scene for the first time in 1302, when he is suddenly lecturing at the University of Paris. And he is eventually kicked out of Paris as a result of the fight between Boniface VIII and Philip the Fair, or the King of France. Scotus, as a good Catholic, had sided with the Pope, and of course, if you're there in the heart of Paris and you're going against the king, you are not going to last very long, let's just put it that way. He is eventually restored, though, in 1304. He returns to Paris, though just a few years later, in 1307, he is sent to the University of Cologne in Germany. And it is shortly thereafter that he dies, and his tomb is there in the city of Cologne ever since. Now, there is one myth that's often associated with this. It is not the case, it is not true, that Scotus had lapped into a coma and that he was actually buried alive. That's one of these urban legends that always arises around important figures, and this is simply not true. But as in keeping with the high Middle Ages, Scotus was a man of multiple countries. In fact, on his tomb to this day, it says, quote, Scotland brought me forth, England sustained me, France taught me, Cologne holds me. And it speaks to something of the cosmopolitan, multinational ways that these scholars would travel from country to country, and since their main language of engagement was Latin, they could do so without much trouble at all. Well, when we transition to Scotus's ideas, to his theology, we have to understand the context. Aquinas, of course, had the lion's share of the attention amongst all those who were scholastic ever since his life and his death. The writings of Aquinas are simply supreme in terms of understanding the sweep of medieval scholastic theology. Not everyone was happy, though, with the teachings of Aquinas. Aquinas seemed to dabble a bit too much in the rational method. He seemed to rely on Aristotle just a bit too much. And we've seen this back and forth. There is a trend towards rationalism and then a reaction back that usually comes with the expression of concern that theologians are relying too much on men like Aristotle and not enough on the scriptures or on the teachings of the church. And this is pretty much what happens here with Aquinas. Aquinas himself is not condemned. However, there are a number of condemnations that come about in the mid to late 1200s. One in particular, the Condemnations of 1277 by the Bishop of Paris. And the Condemnations of 1277 hold 219 theological and philosophical teachings that are considered to be suspect. The Condemnations overtly mention that, quote, some scholars of arts 
are teaching certain things that are now believed to be problematic. And that line is one of the problems of the interpretation of this, because Aquinas was not a teacher of the arts per se, he was a theologian. He was in the higher categories. Still though, it does seem to be the case that these condemnations in particular are meant to stop the application of those who are reading Aquinas from over-reliance on philosophical or extra-biblical categories. The 219 condemnations stress the importance of revealed doctrine in the scriptures as it is taught by the church over against dialectical or rational theological method. And the central thrust of these condemnations is that there are those who are appealing to the independence of the intellect over against anything else. Again, in the dialectical method, there is a privileging of the intellect or of the logical systems that we can think through. And the allegation here is that those who rely too much on the dialectical or the rational method, Aquinas being one, and of course Abelard being a pretty extreme case of this, these men, it is alleged, go too far in the binding of God. They make God subject to the system rather than God as the creator of anything like logic or whatever it might be. And so one of the stresses that comes out of the area of Paris in particular, as a reaction to this method, is an appeal to the omnipotence of God. This idea that God is not subject to the system, that he is not subject to logical forces per se, but that he is omnipotent. He is above any of our rational concepts or our rational methods. And so again, without condemning Aquinas, without throwing him out and condemning his works in general or with any specificity, we see here in the late 1200s, which is right when Scotus is writing and working, a real concern for the ways of dialectical theology and for some of their excesses. And so it is in the context of this that Scotus steps onto the scene. And as we'll see, Scotus in particular is trying to find a way to both be positively associated with the theology of Aquinas. He's not a reactionary. He's not overthrowing Aquinas. Rather, you might say he is tweaking in an effort to perfect the general trajectory as to where Aquinas' thinking was taking us. He tries to put in some brake pedals that stop us from over-reliance on putting God within a box or putting him within a system that may very well be the product of our own categories. Still, though, as we'll see, Scotus actually still relies on many of the same categories or many of the same assumptions that Aquinas himself held. So the way to understand Scotus is you have to see that he is trying to stop some of the problems associated with too much reliance on logic in the intellect without simply overthrowing the system. So he's going to apply brake pedals in some areas, ways that he thinks will stop too many conclusions going down the wrong path. And on the other hand, he's going to add some things, add some discussions to the mix that he believes will open up some new vistas, some new horizons for scholastic thinking. And so when we begin to look at Scotus' ideas, the most important idea that he really is going to tout, again, as a brake pedal to the teachings of Thomas Aquinas, is that Scotus is going to stress that the will is superior to the intellect. Now, the reason he does this is relatively obvious. And he's not the only one to do it, by the way, in this day and age. But what he does is he's saying, essentially, that the intellect matters, that our rational thinking matters. However, the will, the volitional part of our identity, the thing that drives us, is superior in the sense that it can overrule our intellect. You see, with Aquinas, the belief was always there that if you just get the intellect right, if you develop the proper thinking and the proper categories, you can actually penetrate into the complexities of God. You can understand him in his essence. Not fully, by any means. Aquinas is not going to say that. But rather, Aquinas will say that you need to get the intellect shaped in the proper dialectical method. And he believed, flowing out of that, that the will will always follow suit. Scotus comes onto the scene and very quickly he says, no, the will actually can override our intellect. He doesn't want our wills, in other words, to simply be passive instruments. He doesn't like the idea that our choices are based simply on logical thought patterns. But rather, there's something more fundamental that drives us. And of course, this is a view that is shared by just about everybody in the modern world. We always talk about somebody who wants to lose weight or quit smoking or stop bad habits as needing to get their will in shape, not as an idea of getting different facts. Doesn't matter how many diet books someone reads, how many quit smoking campaigns or pamphlets they read, or any of these other kinds of things. The modern person, of course, assumes that it's not a matter of getting new facts into the person's head, 
that's going to change them, but rather it's a product of the will. How the will, the volitional side of us, can almost act impulsively to override what we know to be true. Well, a lot of the wellspring of this does come from Scotus here. Well, what's the implication of what he's saying? Well, in large part, what he's stressing here is not so much a relationship to us, though it obviously has implications for how we view the human soul, how we view the will. Rather, what he is playing here is a move that, again, separates God from the created order. We we'll often refer to this in the modern world as the creator-creature distinction. That is to say, there is only one creator and everything else is created. Well, by stressing the will over the intellect, Scotus believes he has a method for describing how God created what exists, how he created the rational structures of the world, and how he came up with these things in a way that doesn't make him bound to them. You see, because if you say that logic or the dialectical method or the categories of creation, all these very interesting things, or simply the product of an intellectually conceived idea. Well, what ends up happening is you believe that the system itself is almost a software or an operating system that God himself really needs to abide by. You get some of this actually in Aquinas' teachings on ethics, issues related to the moral law, or issues related to God's process of understanding the law in relationship to sin. Aquinas doesn't actually take us to this point, but what the implications are as to what he's saying is that it seems as if God is bound by the system of this world. Again, if you go to Aquinas' teachings on ethics, there is often the implication and occasionally a more expressed reality, a more expressed belief, that God must always do what is right and good. Well, again, the problem here is you have to be careful because if you say that there is a standard that God must live up to, what Scotus is sensitive to and others are sensitive to is that you've essentially bound God to a system. There's some standard above him that he must abide by. Well, the way Scotus gets out of this problem is, again, he stresses the will of God. God's will is superior to the categories of thinking. He then transitions into a discussion about the power of God. And this is an important one because it's one that we still talk about to this very day. And the question is one of, is God bound by creation itself? When God creates things, is he more or less creating things that must exist by necessity? Or is he creating things by the sheer power of his will? And the question here is often described as the problem of the absolute will or the absolute power of God. And there's a very concrete way of thinking about this. When God decided that he was going to create the world, and he was going to make a moral law or a moral code, in which, let's just say, murder and adultery are considered to be evil things, they are sins. Well, Scotus holds out the possibility that God could have created something entirely different. Before he actually created, he had absolute power, hence the word omnipotence. He is utterly free before he creates to create a system or a world that is entirely different from the one that you and I know. Creation, in other words, is essentially arbitrary. Not arbitrary in the sense that it's chaotic, but arbitrary in the sense that God was not bound to create what he did create. Rather, it's an expression of what he wanted to create. God is absolutely free. Now, Scotus is not here trying to argue some type of relativism, as if there is a moral code that is different for each and every one of us. He affirms that once the world is created, this is the world that we know, and this is assumed. We have this world and the law of it and the logic of it and all these things, all the dialectical method that Aquinas loved. Scotus is going to affirm all of those things. He's going to want to continue them in the sense that Aquinas wanted them to continue. However, for Scotus, again, he applies a brake pedal. He says, don't think that you have some grand blueprint by which both God and creation both have to live up to. Your dialectical method is important. But God is not bound by it, beyond the fact that he chose this world to be the way it is, and therefore it is, simply by the will of God. Notice again Scotus's, you might say, salvage or recovery efforts here, to make sure that the teachings of Aquinas and others on dialectical method have a brake pedal, they have a stopgap, but that they can continue within the limits that he places on them. And there are others as well. Scotus very famously attempts to reassert a more positive or a more optimistic description of who God is. In this sense, you might say, to keep the analogy going, 
that SCOTUS is applying more of a gas pedal to the atomistic system. Thomas, as we mentioned, had a great deal to say about the slipperiness of words, how we have to be careful that our words are not simply assumed to always be connecting to God in the most direct sense. Aquinas expressed a number of concerns about how we always equate our language with the existence of God, so that when we describe things as being good, well, how do we know that our concept of good is equivalent to who God is? Well, Scotus wants to actually make sure that we always have a positive whenever we're discussing God. Scotus in particular attacks something that is called the via negativa, or the negative way. And the via negativa is an idea or a tactic that was employed by Aquinas, in which he said that sometimes you come to the conclusion as to what God is, not by positive affirmation, but by whittling away the other options that don't fit. And again, this is called the via negativa. So to go back to the idea of God being good, well, the way that we understand who God is in his goodness is we say, well, is he good the way a slice of cake is good? Well, no, that's a goodness in relationship to taste. Well, is he good in relationship to my goodness or to the goodness of creation itself? Well, no, because there's sin, there's limitations, there's finiteness, all these kinds of things. And so what you do in the via negativa is you work through all the things that are not implied by a certain word or a certain description of God. And then eventually you come down to a more precise conclusion as to what you mean. Well, Scotus has a great response to this. He says, quote, negation is not the object of our love. But that's a very perceptive point. Describing God as good and then simply getting at the definition of goodness through a negative limitation as to what he is not when we say that he's good doesn't actually give us a great deal of, here's that word again, volitional, willful love directed towards God. It rather makes the goodness of God something of a mental gymnastic game. Now, that's not the intention of Aquinas, but what Scotus is highlighting here is that there has to be some positive connection of our words to who God is in order for him to be the object of our love. And the word that Scotus uses here is a new one. He refers to something called the university of being. Now, this always creates a bit of a head scratcher for students. What in the world is the university of being? Well, again, let's go to this problem of our words and how we describe God. The problem in the Middle Ages prior to Scotus was that they really only had two categories for how our words work. Either our words are equivocal or they're unequivocal. So in the case of a word being equivocal, it means that whenever we say that God is good, we're saying that there is an equivalence between his goodness and the word that I'm using to describe him. At times, though, on the other side, we're using analogies to describe God, words that are not equivocal. So if I say that God is a rock, that he is my rock and my redeemer, of course, the implication here is not that he is some type of stone, that he's made of a granite or something like this. That's unequivocal language. The problem with both sides, though, is neither fully connects what we're describing God as being to who God is in and of himself. And Scotus stresses this. On both sides of these equations, whether you're using an analogy or whether you're using equivocal language, both have implied this idea that our words don't quite sync up perfectly with who God is. Even the word equivocal, it means that God is on one side and our meaning of what goodness is, is on this side. And there's no ultimate fundamental connection between the two. Scotus, of course, is going to feel that this is very much alarming. It's going to feel as if our language does not fully describe who God is. And if we love him, if we desire him, if he is the object of our love, then having that separation is a problem. Well, in the, the gap here, Scotus asserts a new idea. The idea of the univocity of being. The idea here is, is that though God is the creator... Though he is far away and he is not to be bound by our system. Still, though, the very creation of things, like us in his image and like the creation itself, means that there is a connection. I'm actually inclined to say there's almost a DNA association between what we're saying, what we know, what we experience, and who God is in and of himself. Now, it's refracted through all types of things in creation. It's never as perfect as it's going to be when we're describing God. But the answer that Scotus gives here, when he's referring to the university of being, 
is he wants to say that when we're describing things, when we're experiencing things, when we use the word goodness, that there is a univocal connection. They are the same thing. One is the goodness that the creatures know, and one is the goodness of God, which is, of course, perfect and eternal. But they're not simply two things far apart, and our language is simply trying to jump the gap to describe who God is. Rather, Scotus argues, because we are the creatures, because we are created by him, the very nature of the creation itself, the very things that we know and experience, have some univocal connection to God. There is an equal sign between our concept of goodness and the ultimate goodness in God himself. And Scotus drives this point home, mostly again out of the concern that the over-reliance on logic and the over-reliance on this description of the problem of language was leading us down the wrong path. And so with Scotus, what we see is a couple of new ventures that as they lead into the latter Middle Ages, begin to bring about a number of changes in how the church approaches the problem of theology. Scotus attempts at his very best to put brake pedals and, as I said, put gas pedals on different sides of the scholastic method. On the one hand, he wants to separate God and make sure that we do not believe that God is bound to the system. However, on the other hand, he doesn't want God to be far off, locked up in heaven, and that all we're doing is trying to describe God with our fumbling words. Rather, instead, he is omnipotent. He is the creator. He's not bound by our system. But nevertheless, because the system is a product of his will and he created it, because of that, our language can truly describe who God is. Mm-hmm.